Good afternoon, everyone. First, I'd like to thank you all for joining us this week in Little Rock and welcome you to the Clinton Presidential Center. I'm Stephanie Street, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Clinton Foundation. And on behalf of all the center staff, we are so honored that the Club de Madrid chose Little Rock as the site for your annual meeting. I'd like to recognize and thank the leadership of the Club de Madrid, President Wim Kock, Secretary General Carlos Westendorp, and Deputy Secretary General Maria Elena Aguero. We commend you for the important work you are doing around the world to address the challenges of democratic governance. Now this meeting would not be possible without the generosity of our premier sponsors who I would like to acknowledge. Axiom, the Ford Foundation, Walmart, the cities of Little Rock and North Little Rock, the Little Rock Convention and Visitors Bureau, Microsoft, and Mac and Donna McClarty. Thank you all so much. <clears throat> the Clinton Presidential Center is an educational and cultural venue that includes the Little Rock offices of the Clinton Foundation, the Clinton Presidential Library and Museum, and the University of Arkansas Clinton School of Public Service, which is our nation's first institution to offer a master's in public service. Since opening its doors in 2004, the Clinton Center has welcomed 2.6 million visitors from around the globe and is one of the top tourism destinations in this region. And the center has helped revitalize downtown Little Rock bringing more than $2.5 billion in economic development to this area. And the Clinton Center serves as an effective venue to highlight the global work of the Clinton Foundation. For more than 11 years, the Clinton Foundation has worked by bringing people together across sectors, continents, and generations to make a measurable impact on some of the biggest challenges of our century. From right here in Little Rock to cities halfway around the world, our diverse portfolio of projects has had one common mission, to provide people and communities with the tools, resources, and the opportunity they need to build stronger futures. And with our partners, we turn innovative ideas into real solutions and collaborate directly with the communities where we operate to ensure that our work can eventually be sustained locally. By building a global network of people, businesses, governments, and non-governmental organizations, we have proven that collectively, we can change more lives than more than any one person or group can do alone. Which is why we are so honored to have you here today. The Club de Madrid has built a network of global leaders who understand the challenges of our interdependent world and the importance of working together to solve them. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Jerry Jones, who was instrumental in the effort to bring this gathering to Little Rock. In addition to serving as Axiom's Chief Legal Officer, Senior Vice President and Assistant Secretary, Jerry has become a thought leader in the area of educational improvements and reform in Arkansas. Additionally, he co-founded You Hire US, an effort to help move the US economy forward by promoting the benefits of hiring unemployed people. Jerry has been a close friend of the Clinton family since 1973 and has a special place in our hearts and often a special place in our office as he, we have partnered together on a number of important projects. Please join me in welcoming Jerry Jones. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. It is indeed my honor to be standing before you today, and thank you for your very kind words, Stephanie. Um, I am Jerry Jones of Axiom. We are a global marketing services company headquartered just a short five-minute walk down the uh, road from the Clinton Presidential Library. And the reason that our headquarters is right there is because President Clinton's library is right here. And when he made the investment in downtown Little Rock, we followed it. And since that time, there's been well over a billion dollars invested east of Main Street. So thank you, Mr. President, for your leadership in doing that. Well, you might be wondering how you found yourself here in Little Rock, Arkansas, um, in the Great Hall of the Library for this conference. And you're going to figure it out pretty soon, but 
all roads do eventually lead back to Little Rock. But actually, it was two years ago at a dinner hosted by some friends from Brazil at the Clinton Global Initiative that I happened to be seated, seated next to Maria Elena. And she was telling me about the good works of the Club de Madrid. And she said that they were going to have an annual meeting in New York City. Well, anything that New York can do, Little Rock can do better. <laughs> so I asked her if it might just be possible, perhaps, for the club to consider bringing the organization to Little Rock. And she said, well, could we do that? Uh, only one answer, well, of course, yes, we can. And then she said, well, if President Clinton would like to do that, we'll try to do that. I said, Maria, this is no longer a hypothetical conversation because I know what the answer to that is gonna be. And later that evening, I happened to be with President Clinton and pitched him on the idea, and he immediately said, well, yes, let's do that. And then he looked back at me and said, Jerry, can we do that? You know what the answer was, we're here. And um, a wonderful team of the president, his staff, the Clinton Foundation, our sponsors, uh, and a whole lot of people have helped make this so, so welcome. I was indeed honored to be asked for some suggestions to be presented to your board of directors for the topic of this conference. And I'm very grateful that you accepted that the topic would be female empowerment. My thoughts on this were driven by many things. For instance, what then First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton said at the fourth United Nations Conference on Women in Beijing in August of 1995, where she said that women's rights are human rights. And she was, and of course she was, right. And by the words of An Su, San Suu Kyi at the same conference, but then under house arrest and speaking video, via videotape where she noted that in societies where men are truly confident, women are not merely tolerated, they are valued. As well as by Benazar Bhutto, speaking at, again at the same conference as the first female president of a Muslim majority nation, where she said, in the fight for the liberation of women, there can be no neutrality. And my thoughts were also influenced by my personal experiences around the globe. I will never, ever forget meeting Soraya Paksad from Afghanistan, who told me that at age 12, she witnessed her headmaster, her headmistress, her teacher, being murdered in her classroom because that teacher was teaching young girls. A few weeks later, she saw one of her classmates pass on from the death of a rocket that had been fired at the school. Again, as a warning, you best not teach the girls of Afghanistan. Yet rather than retreating, and at great risk to herself, she's now courageously dedicated her life to bringing education to the girls of Afghanistan so that they can have a better foundation for their lives. And I was also influenced by our American journey. And we have come a long way. But you know, I've, I've seen women not having the same rights and opportunities as men. Where, for example, we have elected 28 presidents of the United States of America only by men. Only by men. So almost twice as many of our presidents were only elected by men. And we still have not had our first female president. Though I'm hoping that's not gonna be much longer. And from seeing the opportunities and personal choices of women, sometimes restricted by laws, sometimes restricted by culture, and sometimes restricted by the powerful forces of inertia, and knowing that we can and should do better. And in seeing the looks of hope in the eyes of mothers and fathers and grandmothers and grandfathers that their daughters and granddaughters would have equal opportunities and equal rights as their sons and grandsons and be able to live their lives to their fullest potentials. And of course, my thoughts were shaped by strong women in my life. And we all have strong women in our lives. But my mother, my sisters, my wife, our daughter-in-law and some of my very closest friends in this room have all shown me that when women are given an opportunity, when they have a fair chance they will seize that opportunity, 
bust down whatever barriers are in their way, and make good things happen for themselves and for society. All of these things combine to compel me to suggest the topic. And as was true with the Beijing conference, and hopefully with this one, as we gather here in this meaningful building by the Arkansas River, whose waters flow from here and mix and mingle around the globe, as I hope the message from this conference will, in the shadow of the bridges that connect our state and in the presence of one of the leaders who helped build the bridges of opportunity and fairness as a pathway to the 21st century. It is my hope that here, this week, we will, together, find ideas and effective ways to pick up the pace and move gender equality and female empowerment forward. And importantly, that good things will get done and not just talked about. As Secretary Clinton has said, female empowerment and equality are some of the most important pieces of unfinished business of the 20th century. And I'm confident that we will, together, make progress. And now it's my special honor to introduce someone who needs no formal introduction, but is a friend of almost 40 years standing, of not only myself, but many of you in this room, the Secretary of State of the United States of America, Hillary Clinton, via videotape. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Arkansas. I'm so sorry that I cannot be with you personally, but I am delighted that you will have the chance to enjoy a place that Bill and I have uh, so loved uh, for so many years. He from birth and me from the wonderful time that I spent uh, in Little Rock. And now you get to see the library and so many of the other places that uh, have really been developed uh, thanks to uh, Bill's leadership. It's wonderful that you're meeting uh, in uh, Arkansas at this time. I want particularly to thank uh, my good friend Jerry Jones, uh, who has done so much to help uh, make this meeting possible. Jerry said that you'd be discussing a lot of important matters, but one that is particularly close to my heart is how to harness the power of women around the world. So even though I can't be with you, I wanted to lend my voice and support uh, to so many who are working hard on this issue that is very uh, important to me. Because you know, elevating the status of women and closing the gender gap is a powerful prescription for sustainable growth. The evidence is absolutely clear. The debate should be over, but unfortunately, all over the world, women still face enormous obstacles uh, trying to gain the same opportunities uh, as men. That's why the United States has been working tirelessly to develop concrete solutions to such obstacles, to try to give more women and girls uh, the chance to realize their own potential. That is now a cornerstone of our foreign policy. And we know we are not alone in this effort. Uh, your meeting and others like it are necessary to really focus in, to obtain uh, the attention of governments and the private sector and people everywhere uh, in order to really have a plan of action about what each of us can do. Because if we unleash the full potential of all people, women and men, uh, boys and girls, uh, we will grow economies, we will create greater prosperity, and I believe build a stronger foundation for peace. I think we can all agree there is not a problem in our world that cannot be made better if women are involved in the solution. And I thank you for coming together with your experience, uh, your leadership, with all that you are doing to uh, look at this problem among everything else that you will be talking about. And I look forward to learning of the outcomes of the conference. I'm delighted to welcome you from a distance and encourage you to enjoy the hospitality of Arkansas. And I look forward to uh, having a chance to see many of you sometime soon in the future. Take care. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to introduce Prime Minister Wim Kok, former pr Prime Minister of the Netherlands and President of the Club de Madrid. Prime Minister.
Good afternoon. Let me first of all say how delighted I was to see Secretary Hillary Clinton uh, speaking to us, knowing that she's now had some health problems. I he hear from President Clinton that she is uh, uh, recovering now. This, she, uh, the concern is not there that any longer. And I think I am a messenger on behalf of all the participants here uh, when I say that we wish her a quick and full recovery from Little Rock back to her home. <clears throat> Well, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's uh, my intense pleasure to welcome you all um, uh, to the Club of Madrid annual conference, which is the year, this year focuses on the very important theme of women's political and economic empowerment. Members of the Club of Madrid, uh, conference partners, speakers, participants, all key stakeholders and actors engaged and committed to moving the women's agenda forward, is, as, is it's, true, it's truly a joy to have you all with us here today. And I would like to take the opportunity to especially thank President Clinton for his hospitality and presence, as well as the team of the President Clinton's Foundation and the Clinton Presidential Center, all of whom have been vital in making this gathering and the discussion we will have possible. I also wish to thank the state of Arkansas and the cities of Little Rock and North Little Rock, who have so enthusiastically and generously supported the organization of this event. Governor Beeb, Mayor Stodola, or Stodola, um, Mayor Hayes, Jerry Jones. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be in Little Rock and to get a feel of true southern warmth and hospitality. A very special word of welcome, uh, go, of thanks, goes to Anxiom, Walmart, and Microsoft, all private firms, uh, firms that know very well the importance of women's empowerment for not only the full realization of society, but also for making the best possible use of their business opportunities. World-leading uh, multilateral institutions and foundations such as the Ford Foundation, UN Women, uh, International Labour Organization, the Council of Women Leaders, Women World Leaders, NATO, and the Institute for Inclusive Society have also come on board with a shared vision on the need to refine, redefine gender and development strategies beyond 2015. Today, we have gathered approximately 180 participants from different um, Sect, sect, sectors of society and from over 50 countries covering all continents except Antarctica around this all important issue of women's political and economic empowerment. Over 30 former heads of state and government will have the opportunity to exchange and share views and experiences with grassroots civil society representatives from countries as varied as Samoa, Papua New Guinea, Australia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, Ghana, Rwanda, Colombia, Peru, and Argentina. And probably I forget there's one or two countries. And this has been made possible thanks to the support of those partners mentioned before but also of the New Field Foundation, the Inter-American Development Bank, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of New Zealand. Before going into the substance of the issues we will be addressing these two days, allow me first to, very briefly, share a bit of information about the Club of Madrid, our general objectives, and what brings us here today. The Club of Madrid is an independent organization dedicated to strengthening democratic values and leadership around the world by drawing on the unique individual and collective experience and resources of its members. To date, 93 democratic former heads of state and government from over 60 countries who contribute their time, experience, and credibility to this mission. 
Calling on our members' leadership experience, the organization identifies and addresses policy challenges and leadership issues at both the international and national levels, as well as directly with leaders in transitional and consolidating democracies, developing practical recommendations, action plans, and implementation strategies to advance democratic development. The members that make up the Club of Madrid represent their personal leadership experience and commitment, not their countries or their parties. As former presidents or former prime ministers, we are free to share our experience without the constraints of office, while still keenly aware of the pressures and problems faced by today's leaders. The Club de Madrid works with governments, internet, intergovernmental organizations, civil society, scholars and the business world, building bridges between them and encouraging dialogue that can foster social and political change. So why focus our annual conference this year on women? Because increasing women's political and economic empowerment is imperative for democracy to be fully realized. And we have been focusing on this as a prior priority issue from our very establishment. Even though this argument is now popular knowledge to many, we are at the juncture of the international development agenda, where serious deficiencies in the implementation of certain rights are underscored by the international economic crisis. The moment is ripe to avoid backtracking and deeply reflect on the main elements missing in the women's agenda, those that preclude an enabling environment for both men and women to, be, to make full use of their potential and close the gender gap. This is essential for the sustainability of our socio-economic system as a whole. Processes such as Rio Plus 20 and the revision of the Millennium Goals into the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015 are underway, and we believe the conclusions that come out of this conference can serve to further feed these important dis discussions. Through increased participation and decision-making, capacity in both politics and economics. Women will continue to promote women's participation in a virtuous cycle, while also advocating for greater attention to issues typically of particular concern to women and children. As a result, policy and legislation on issues such as sexual, sexual and reproductive rights, trafficking of women and children, work-life balance, childcare, education, domestic violence and income generation for women are all essential. This is why we have today chosen to focus on issues that deserve a revised analysis in the search for better strategies. Addressing equality in the boardroom and beyond, harnessing technology for empowerment, establishing effective peace and security processes, achieving a sustainable work-life balance, women's access and control of natural resources, and effective strategies to address trafficking. We have already heard at lunch about women in art and media and the impact and danger of stereotypes and of, and of constraints on women's very existence. Tomorrow, we will be hearing about how movements towards greater accountability in the Middle East region can give way to a revised social contract for women in the region. These are all very timely issues you will be analyzing in the breakout sessions, where we encourage you to engage in dynamic discussions focused on the objective of the conference, namely uh, to get uh, kind of ideas and results we can work on further. Facilitators here have the challenging, challenging task at hand, and you may have, and you have my sympathy. It is almost, it's most difficult to stop a politician from talking about passionate subjects such as these, the objective of the conference, which is to identify those policy recommendations as well as accompanying capacity building initiatives that can make the women's agenda more effective. At the plenary, bringing it all together, you will all have the opportunity in the last round of Q&A to share ideas on concrete new possible initiatives. So from the Club de Madrid, we are determined to continue supporting the women's agenda. Gatherings like this help the Club de Madrid reinforce our commitment with this priority 
as well as build stronger links with other like-minded organizations working for common goals. Sharing our lessons learned from fieldwork and knowledge analysis, I hope will allow us to leave this conference with concrete proposals for action that will allow us to advance on this common purpose. We hope connections made and networks enriched during this conference will continue to benefit participants, as well as help us advocate for the full real realization of women's potential. We hope many of you may remain connected, enabling you to serve as key resources, partners and allies throughout these processes. These relationships con constitute a stock of knowledge and support resources that can be tapped and has the potential to facilitate government and civil society action in the field of women's empowerment in different regions of the world. I truly hope you will leave Little Rock inspired by potential new initiatives to advance the women's agenda. Democracy, progress and equity, all core values for the Club de Madrid and values that all of us here cherish and are committed to fostering will be empty words and will remain to be empty words without effective policies designed by all and for all. There is no democracy or justice that can leave aside 50% of the population. I wish you all a productive and enriching conference and thank you for your time and active participation. It's now a pleasure for me to invite on stage the speakers of the first plenary framing the debate. Presidents Mary Robinson, Rosa Uta, Utun, Utun Baeva, sorry for the mistake in the pronunciation, Felipe Gonzalez, Joachim Kisano, and last but not least, President Bill Clinton. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to get into the program. So I, I don't want to make a speech. I do want to welcome you to my native state and to the Clinton Presidential Center. I want to thank all of you for being here. I, I thank Jerry Jones and all the other sponsors and Stephanie Street and all the people here who've worked to make this a success. And. Um, my longtime friend, Wim Cock, former colleague, thank you. And I was looking at the list of people here. I have worked at some point when I was president, I worked with more than half of the heads of state and government who are here. And I'm very glad that you have come. The only off topic thing I wish to say is to everyone who's here and to our friends in the press who are covering this, is that all these people could be doing something else. And they still are public-spirited. They still care about the countries they, they came from and the world they live in and the world they hope we will live to leave to our grandchildren. And I am personally very grateful for their ongoing and highly practical approach to this. I have been involved in one way or the other with the Club of Madrid since it began, and I'm very grateful especially to the Spanish government uh, and uh, the King of Spain who supported it in the beginning. And I want to thank all the people here on the platform with me. Now, here's what we're supposed to do today. We've all worked in one way or the other to advance the rights of women and girls. We all recognize that if you practice discrimination and bigotry and outright violence and trafficking, if you disempower women and girls, it is a severe constraint on growth and it makes true democracy impossible. But there is a great deal of difference between <clears throat> talking about this and doing something about it. <clears throat> There's a lot to be happy about. It's great that 56% of the parliament in Rwanda are women. It's tragic that it almost certainly would not have happened 
had it not been for the genocide where 80% of the victims were men. It's a tribute to the government of Rwanda and to the people, but it's the exception, not the rule. There are many other places in the world where there have been stunning advances, and the presence of President Otomayeva and President Mary Robinson is an example of that. But don't forget, just in the last few weeks, we had a 14-year-old girl in Pakistan shot and nearly killed because she wanted an education. We had a 17-year-old girl in Afghanistan despairing of the fact that she was first in her class, dreamed of going to medical school, was going to be forced by her own parents into an arranged marriage. So she tried to commit suicide by jumping off the house, broke her back, was turned into an invalid. And finally, the gender court set up by Afghanistan with a woman judge that had typically ruled against the claims of girls and women ruled that she had a right not to be forced in this arranged marriage. Now what will become of her? It's up to me. She'll go to medical school and university first. But, and then just a couple of days ago in Nepal, another young woman burned over 90% of her body by her alleged fiance because of this arranged marriage that she desperately didn't want to go through. He was allowed to come into her house and do that. So we still have a long way to go. And I will begin by asking our panelists to discuss this. And I'll tell you, this panel is supposed to produce somewhere between three and five specific recommendations about concrete things we can do to make a difference going forward. So I will begin with this question, and I will start with Mary Robinson, and just ask everybody then to follow there is still a glaring gap between actually stating policies or even passing laws and implementing them, as you see in what's happened with, in the gender court in Afghanistan. You shouldn't have to break your back to dissolve a marriage being forced on you as a child. So what specifically can we do or what can we help governments and local civil society to do to close the gap between stated policy and real reality in the lives of women in all these countries. Mary. Okay, thank you. I'm happy to take that on. I just love the theme of this conference, and I think it's great that it's been so well organized and there are such fantastic people here, including a number of women that I've worked with and I'm overjoyed to see here. But I will answer um, your questions, um, particularly with, I think, um, the knowledge that we have to be more innovative. And there have been some innovative examples where uh, women have created structures that help to make change. Um, one of them is the Council of Women World Leaders. I remember being in Stockholm in 1996 uh, with a number of other, very few at that time, uh, women presidents and prime ministers. And uh, Laura Liswood, who's still the Secretary General of the Council, um, had done um, videos about us, about our lives, and that had created a certain um, interest. Um, when the uh, council was formed, Vigdis Finnbogadottir, the outgoing president of Iceland, became the first president, then Kim Campbell, who is here. Um, I took over from Kim and was very glad to pass the baton to Tarja Halnan, who's also here. And the council helped to uh, encourage uh, women ministers to come together in areas of the environment, finance, defense, etc. And we worked very closely with Madeleine Albright and then it's um, uh, Margaret um, Walser, uh, and um, that's one example. Um, I think that idea of critical mass is very important. Um, if we have a critical mass of women in a parliament, then priorities change. I saw that myself when I was first elected to the Senate um, in um, uh, 1989, 1969, um, sorry. Um, there were only six of us out of a group of 60. When we got the critical mass, things began to change. So let me give a recent example of an innovative way of bringing out gender in an important area that worked. It's called the Doha Miracle. And it was about recognizing that climate has a huge impact 
on women in particular, differential impact on women and men at grassroots because of the problems of food security, water, etc. And so uh, we decided to be opportunist, opportunistic about the fact that there were three women who had chaired, or in the case of South Africa, were about to chair conferences of the parties. Connie Hedegaard chaired Copenhagen, Patricia Espinosa chaired Mexico, um, Cancun, and Mighty Mashaban was going to chair Durban for South Africa. So in Cancun, we persuaded those three women, and they were very willing, to form a troika of women leaders, which became a troika plus, which Michel Bachelet, who unfortunately couldn't be here, which is why I'm substituting for her, um, Michel Bachelet, Helen Clark, and over 60, mainly women ministers for environment and energy, but also a few supportive men, formed a troika plus of women leaders. In Durban, with strong support from Mighty Mashaban, we decided we needed to strengthen the decision of women being represented on the bodies of the UNFCCC, the Kyoto Protocol, and the delegations going to the climate conferences. It's a very male environment, has been and still is. So we worked together with UN Women and my foundation. We drafted a text, and we got the European Union, with the help of Finland, to get that text agreed by the 27 countries. And we talked to other countries, Bangladesh and others, to be sure that we brought support, Grenada and the United States. And then the EU tabled this draft decision as under any other business at the conference just um, uh, less than two weeks ago. And when I arrived in, um, in um, Doha, um, on the 26th of November, because there was to be a gender day on the 27th, we discovered there was a procedural problem that something tabled as any other business couldn't become a decision of the conference. And I was devastated because we'd been working on this for nearly a year, and I said, this can't be. And then Christiana Figueri said, well, it's almost impossible. So we said, well, define almost. And it turned out that if the presidency of the conference, which was Qatar, Minister Ali Alataya, if he took it on, saying there is broad support for this, and as presidency, I will send it to the plenary that negotiates the SBI for decision. And that is, in effect, what happened. We had to create um, a, a, a great sense that this was important on the floor once the, when the Cypriot presidency of the EU moved it. And you had Grenada coming in, you had Bangladesh, you had India, you had the United States, you had Mexico, and then South Africa really said you know, to the poor minister, you are the first man after three women. You can advance gender. The upshot was we got a very robust decision which now says there has to be gender balance in all the bodies of the UNFCCC, including Green Climate Fund and so on. There has to be gender balance in the delegations. Um, there is an item now for future years of gender and climate change. And there is um, a workshop that will talk about climate-influenced, uh, gender-sensitive climate policy. Um, so uh, I think it's, it's, it's a question of being innovative and using the, the idea of critical mass of women um, making a difference and getting the support. But that is a specific example, and we have to build on that now. Thank you. Uh, president Chisano, I remember when I came to Africa as president, I came to see you, and we had our first visit and began our friendship. Um, in another country, I met with uh, women who were bounding the uh, joining together then in the late 90s to end the practice of female genital mutilation. And the thing that struck me was that they had a very, they were in a minority, but they still had a robust and brave representation of men from their villages who were expressing support for them. So uh, you may say whatever you want to the general question, but I'm wondering, uh, specifically from your own experience, how important do you think it is that men take a leadership role in this and back it up so that it doesn't seem to be only women who are arguing for women's rights? Thank you very much. And thank you for remembering your visit to Mozambique in a positive way. Um, I think that uh, in my country, that happened because all education about this issue started when we were fighting for independence. And from that time, we knew that we could not win this war with the 
more than 50% of uh, people not participating in the fight. At the beginning, we thought that the women would play a secondary role in the, in the struggle. But the women themselves, they claimed the right to take up guns and fight side by side with men. And uh, some of them became instructors, instructors of men. So we have developed this uh, from that time, but we had a big uh, work to do after independence because not everybody had participated in the armed struggle for independence. So we had the two uh, together, men and women who participated in the struggle to educate our men who were still uh, living uh, the old life. And uh, because you, you, you might know that uh, in my country, more than 90% of women were illiterate. But uh, men were not that much literate also. So they were guided by a uh, tradition. Uh, early age marriages, polygamy, uh, and uh, this issue of not letting their children to go to school, even boys, but uh, for girls it was worse because uh, the girls had to be educated only on domestic things, to be prepared to be mothers and to take care of, of domestic uh, things. So we, we, we had to educate uh, men, first of all, to change uh, uh, of their mentality, but also the women who were enslaved in their brains uh, because they thought that they could not uh, compete with men, but they had to learn how to compete uh, with men. And through the associations which we created, we had a big a movement of women which developed from the uh, liberation struggle and now it's, it's a big movement. Uh, so all the dialogue would continue through these associations uh, and men started changing slowly though and still we have many who did not change completely and we have to continue to, 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 to fight for this change of mentality uh, of the whole society. Yeah, uh, it's, it's true that uh, we have gone a, a long way because uh, we succeeded uh, to convince the people by appointing ministers who, uh, 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 first of all, uh, when I came to the presidency, then I appointed for the first time the prime minister was a woman. Uh, today we have a, a speaker who is a woman and a deputy speaker who is a woman and, uh, and so on. Ministers of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Labor, Minister of uh, Mining is a, is a, a woman. Uh, so in the past, the tendency was to say, well, women can be Minister of Social Affairs or health, but now we say no, mineral resources. So to speak that the management of resources can be done by women. Uh, so this has convinced men that this, there's a cause to fight for, uh, that our capacity of development may be enhanced if these 51% of people could be involved. That's why you, you find a lot of, of men who are in favor of, uh, of emancipation uh, of women. Soon we'll be speaking about just rights because what guides our principles is human rights, not women, women's rights, but human rights because we consider they're equal. They're, and we don't want this discrimination. Yeah. We, so although we, in order to create seats or more posts for women, we do sometimes a positive discrimination by supplying quotas. And here I would speak about the role of the political parties. 
Because if we have 35% of women in our parliament, it's because our party has established quotas in, 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 in a, the primaries, if you, you like, so that women be featuring in the list of those who could be elected to the parliament. So I will stop there for the time being. Well, first of all, thank you very much. I, <clears throat> as you know, I've been working for the last decade in Mozambique on health care issues, so I've, I go there often and I've seen these changes that you started. And the reason I ask, I remember um, reading the first time I went there about the fact that you included women not only in the combat roles in the revolution, but also if they were exceptionally good in training others, including men. In an ideal world, if we all had enough to eat and we all had total security, physical and psychological security, we would educate each other and then we would be able to imagine changes that we had not experienced. In the real world, most people are struggling to deal with their own challenges. And therefore, they are much more likely to embrace changes that they have experienced. And I, I, that's why I ask you what I did. I think when soldiers saw these women fighting and then saw that these women had extraordinary skill and could train them, and then saw a woman, a woman perform as prime minister, I think that affects what happens in homes and communities at all across the country. Most people, sadly, still have to experience something positive about a change to fully embrace it. And I thank you for saying that. Let, let me ask you, President Otombayeva, when you were, when you became president, did it change the attitude of men toward women in your country? And if so, how? Uh, first of all, I want to, to tell you, President Clinton, I was the first ambassador of Kyrgyzstan who came to the United States yep. in July 92. And uh, yeah, that was the time of uh, your uh, campaign still going on. And uh, I do remember well that uh, uh, after November, still uh, you've not been in office. I presented my credentials to Senior Bush. And in January, we came to the White House to have a great picture with you. And uh, now, uh, I, it, it was 20 years ago. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> and um, I became president um, two years ago. It was April 2010. And it was emergency. It was a critical situation in my country. When people came to the Central Square to protest against the criminal regime, and they've been uh, shot from the windows of the White House. Uh, more than uh, uh, eight, 87 people died. And uh, this criminal regime unleashed a later uh, interethnical conflict in the south of my country. So we uh, have decided that night that we'll take a power. We took the power from the floor, full of blood, and uh, I was uh, elected uh, or appointed by my colleagues, uh, heads of opposition parties, as uh, uh, head of interim government. We uh, immediately decided uh, that uh, in half a year we'll conduct uh, parliamentary elections. In uh, uh, nine months, uh, uh, first we, we had a referendum where we approved uh, the uh, new constitution of the parliamentary system. Kyrgyzstan is only country in Central Asia and probably in big Eurasia with the parliamentary system. And then, uh, in, in this one and a half years of my presidency, I have conducted three elections, referendum, parliamentary elections, and presidential elections. And then I passed over the power to president-elected, 
And this is first ever such a peaceful transfer of the power in our region. <laughs> and uh, people uh, very often refer to the uh, events of uh, in, in Arab uh, countries which swept uh, hurricane of Arab Spring, and so they ask uh, me, how did you succeed? Uh, how it's happened that uh, in one and a half years you have managed uh, to uh, conduct, <coughs> to build all the um, institutes of the power? I do believe that it was because our uh, fair, consistent uh, commitment uh, to the promises which we give the, to the people. And uh, time came to clean up the house after decades of uh, uh, corruption in my country. I put forward um, uh, women as uh, uh, chair of the, uh, of the Supreme Court, women as prosecutor general, women as uh, governor of National Bank, all of them, they still work there. They uh, gone through the parliament. Parliament has approved them. In my country, by quota, we have 23% of women in the parliament. We have uh, just recently, President Decumbent, uh, he has uh, appointed uh, uh, chairwomen of national audit. In other words, in the time of crisis, all of us women came to the power and uh, we've done our work fairly, we've done our work honestly, and that was the secret of our success. And just a follow-up question. Do you believe that today the attitudes of the men in Kyrgyzstan about, the, about equal treatment of women have changed, not just in politics, but generally? Um, President Clinton, we have a struggle between new and old. Uh, uh, new uh, follows uh, after the failure, and uh, because we, uh, we are the country with uh, such a deep tradition of uh, Asia, with Asian our values, then women probably are um, in not a good position. I'm afraid we used to live in better time, and I do think about a generation of my daughter and my grandchildren, and uh, uh, you are right, we should work with the women, we should change their mind, and uh, it's endless work. Uh, there are violence against women, there are old attitudes, uh, uh, but uh, our presence in the power makes uh, women uh, stronger. They do believe that they can change the situation around. Uh, we have uh, about 5,000 NGOs, and most of them are led by women. In this transition time, which we're uh, passing still, uh, women uh, didn't wait sitting home. They went uh, forward and uh, putting all the troubles of this transition time on their shoulders. We have very mature uh, microcredit uh, movement in my, Kirby, in my country. And uh, most of them are women, more than half a million borrowers. So women are uh, protecting themselves, working, and uh, men, they certainly, it takes time. I guess it takes time to change them. Yes. Do you think younger men are more open to bigger roles for women than older men? Or do you think it, does age have anything to do with it? Or is it more about the circumstances of their lives? No, this is our tradition. This is uh, for how we, uh, we used to live. Uh, although in my country, we are nomads, uh, Kyrgyz people, riding the horse, uh, sharing the, all the difficulties, troubles of the life, and uh, women ride, uh, sitting alongside of the men and uh, taking care of everything at home. So we are not uh, just a settled uh, home behind the fences. Uh, 
uh, in the scarves. No, we've been uh, all the time free, uh, strong, uh, and alongside of the women. But all the cruelties, all the problems which uh, women facing, they are there. My country uh, finished the Soviet days with almost 100% of literacy, but we are uh, sliding down a bit. Uh, and this is a big problem also. And again, women are in the first uh, place now. Uh, I uh, work with my foundation, and I plunged into the early childhood. This is my beloved topic, and uh, I work very hard to bring up uh, uh, children who are not uh, uh, under care. We have quite a big uh, portion of uh, nation in uh, migration. If uh, do you, th you think uh, uh, Philippines or uh, Mexico are uh, countries, uh, traditional countries of migration, no, you are wrong. Countries of uh, Central Asia, uh, Southern Caucasus, uh, uh, number of people uh, in migration, it's beyond 20% of their population. So they leave their children behind them in the hands of grandparents, uncles, and uh, tants, and uh, aunts, and uh, this is a really big problem. So I think uh, uh, we have a lot of problem of mother and children, maternal mortality, children, uh, baby mortality, those are still high. Thank you. <coughs> Felipe Gonzalez was <coughs> leading, excuse me, <coughs> was the leader of Spain uh, when I became president. So we have been friends for 20 years now. And he has been very active from the day he left office, especially uh, in our neighborhood in South America and the rest of Latin America. And he has done many good things. And uh, it, you may discuss whatever you want, but I wish you would talk a little bit about whether you believe that the election of a fair number of women to prominent positions in Spanish-speaking nations, and now to the presidency of Brazil, uh, but including the president of Argentina, the president of Costa Rica, um, and all over the Caribbean, has this made a difference? And I wish you would say something about the economic crisis that afflicts most of the world today. Because what I see happening is in places where there is great economic insecurity, people tend to try to hold on more to what they have. And it, I think it is blocking the advance of women's rights. President Shusano talked about involving women in the war and how that helped. And I think if they were involved in many of the other conflicts in Africa, we wouldn't have some of the horrible abuses of women that we have. But in cases of economic adversity, I think it's easier to push back women's rights to a back seat. So tell me what you think about what's going on among Spanish-speaking countries. Tell me what you think about this whole, what is the impact of the economic situation? And what should we do about it? Yo voy a hablar en la segunda lengua de Estados Unidos. Verá, Presidente, necesitamos un relato para el siglo XXI que complete el relato de la lucha desde las sufragistas hasta la incorporación a la cadena de producción industrial en la Primera Guerra Mundial, porque los hombres estaban en la guerra, demostrando en la práctica que las mujeres podrían hacer el mismo trabajo, hasta la lucha más reciente por las cuotas o por la paridad en las listas electorales en el gobierno que hizo José Luis Rodrigo Zapatero en España. ¿Por qué digo que necesitamos un nuevo relato? Porque yo creo que tenemos que convencer a hombres y mujeres o a mujeres. Ah, no va. Right? 
Está, le está pasando lo mismo que a mí al principio. De la... Sí. ¿Está allá? Muy bien. Eh, presidente, decía que necesitamos un nuevo relato para el siglo XXI, de la incorporación de la mujer a todas las responsabilidades, eh, no es ya la lucha por un derecho, que también, eh, no es la lucha por la igualdad, que también, es una necesidad para el éxito de la sociedad. Si, si fuéramos capaces de completar el relato como la historia de un relato reivindicativo que va a tener que seguir, para completarla con la historia de que las sociedades para ser exitosas necesitan a las mujeres, probablemente cambiaríamos el signo de la propia lucha tanto para los hombres como para las mujeres. ¿Y por qué digo que necesito a las mujeres? Y sería el centro del relato. Porque cuando explican la superioridad, entre comillas, de los hombres en la sociedad, cuya variable estratégica es la fuerza, la fuerza física, el dominio de la bestia o la capacidad para arar la tierra, etc. Nos están dando un fundamento muy bueno para la sociedad del siglo XXI, que es la sociedad del conocimiento, por muchas diferencias que haya entre los distintos grados de desarrollo. Y si fuéramos capaces de argumentar bien que en la sociedad del conocimiento más de la mitad del conocimiento es femenino y que aquellos países que desaprovechen la gran variable estratégica que es el conocimiento van a fracasar. En la sociedad del conocimiento esa variable estratégica está por encima de los hombros y esa variable estratégica todas las cifras demuestran eh, que las mujeres son digamos, mucho más eficientes en el uso del conocimiento en prácticamente todas las materias analizadas que los hombres. Por eso digo, ¿cómo darle un impulso a ese relato? ¿Cómo mostrarle a todos los pueblos, a todas las sociedades, que si por razones culturales, por razones de costumbres, por razones religiosas, desaprovechan a la mitad de su capital humano van a fracasar en el siglo XXI. O en sentido contrario, si incorporan a esa mitad del capital humano, a esa variable estratégica que aporta tanto la mujer como el hombre, que es el conocimiento, la inteligencia, van a tener muchas más posibilidades de éxito. Es decir, cómo convertir una parte del discurso en un discurso positivo que no es solo la lucha por la igualdad de derechos, que no es solo la lucha por la igualdad de retribución con el mismo salario. Ya comprendo que la situación actual, era la segunda parte de la pregunta que decía el presidente Clinton, sigue mostrando que la crisis tiene nombre de mujer, pesa más en las mujeres, que la pobreza, que la marginación sigue siendo más masculina que femenina, en los momentos de más femenina que masculina. En los momentos de crisis es mucho más verdad que el padecimiento no se reparte equitativamente. Sufre más la mujer y la infancia. Es evidente, está súper demostrado. Pero creo que lo que necesitamos, presidente, necesitamos construir es un relato para el siglo XXI y un relato en positivo un relato que sea capaz de tocar a los hombres y a las mujeres, porque la resistencia para la incorporación de la mujer no es solo masculina, no es verdad, es masculina y femenina. Y no es solo de las sociedades con menos nivel de desarrollo, es también de las sociedades con alto nivel de desarrollo. 
Por tanto, creo que el foco debería estar en ese discurso positivo, no es la lucha solo, no es solo la lucha por la igualdad de derechos, es la convicción de las sociedades de que necesitan de la mujer para tener éxito, para ser competitivas, para incorporarse a la nueva civilización global. Thank you. First of all, as usual, you've made what I think is a very pivotal point, which is that we cannot get into the position when we have these meetings of just telling people to stop doing bad things. We have to paint a picture of all the good things that will happen if women are equally empowered, which is uh, what you just said that you did in your government and not appointing all these people. And I, I think that's something we should all remember. Now, let me ask you, to the conference organizer, how much time do we have? Are we out of time? Okay, what? Ten minutes? Okay. I want to ask if any of the people out here would like to ask any of the panelists a question or offer a different suggestion, which is how to turn our good intentions into real changes. Well, we have people all over the world where it's not acceptable in most places to be a prime minister or a president and be overtly hostile to women's rights. I was beginning to think it might be in America, but it turned out not to be. The, but it's not acceptable. But there's a great deal of difference between saying something and doing something. So I want to give other people the opportunity. Uh, we'll begin with the lady back here and then here. Somebody take a mic. Yes, go ahead. Actually. Please identify yourselves and, and then be as quick as you can because okay. I want to ever hear uh, from as many. My name is Lena. I am from Amman, Jordan. I just want to pose a question for all of us. We know that 50% of the population are women. We know that more than 50% graduates from universities are women. Why till now we are facing, we are not reaching where we want to reach? We, I want to see, maybe our story is not appealing. We are talking, talking, but on the ground, it's not there. What's missing? Entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs are less than one third of the uh, entrepreneurs. They are staying in business less than uh, males. We are not represented as we need to represent. We are, we need to unleash the potential of women. Why still since ages we are talking and we, what is, me, how can we do it faster? How can we implement it on the ground? So I'm posing for everybody because really it's a question, it's a pity that half of the population is under uh, marginalized. Thank you. I want to, I'll take a few uh, comments and then I'll give our panelists a chance to answer. Go ahead, would you like to go next? Gracias, quiero hablar en español igual que el Presidente González. Uh, en primer lugar, quisiera expresarle al gobierno norteamericano y a todos los ciudadanos norteamericanos nuestras condolencias por lo que pasó el viernes pasado con la muerte de tantos niños. La verdad que creo que aquí todos tenemos el mismo sentimiento de expresar uh, la pena por lo ocurrido. En relación a las preguntas, uh, yo quisiera saber, ustedes, expresidentes y ex primeros ministros, si cuando ustedes fueron presidentes lo hubieran hecho mejor con relación a a buscar justamente esa igualdad que es necesaria para el desarrollo del mundo. Si realmente hemos estado hablando de países democráticos, me imagino que desde antes hubiéramos podido trabajar un poquito más. Y segundo es, si realmente a través de imposiciones de ustedes, los países donantes, se hubiese podido lograr establecer como obligatorio la igualdad, es decir, sancionando, no te doy donaciones o fondos, 
a cambio de que usted establezca primero la igualdad. Y creo que no se hizo. Y finalmente al presidente Rodríguez Zapatero, felicitaciones de los que están aquí. Fue el único que estableció la paridad hombre-mujer en su gabinete de gobierno. Gracias. I'm Manaz Afghami, uh, former Minister of Women from Iran in a, in a different world, and uh, head of the Women's Learning Partnership. Uh, I wanted to bring up the question uh, that uh, uh, our partners in the MENA region especially are struggling with, which I think is both a question and an answer, and that is the attitude that the international community has in recent decades taken towards culture. Uh, I think that throughout the world, throughout history, whenever we have moved toward democracy, toward human rights, toward inclusion, there has been a necessary culture change because that's not how we started. So now in this century also, we need to look squarely at the question of culture change. That doesn't mean that we do not take into account issues of Uh, cuisine, of music, of rites of passage. Uh, we're talking about values, and we're talking about universal human rights. And unless we accept, both on the conservative side of the fundamentalists across the world and on the liberal side who wants to uh, honor diversity, unless we squarely believe that there are certain things that have to change, and those change are usually have to come with changes of culture, which is embedded in everyone's culture, women and men, and simply having women in positions of power is not going to help us unless we strictly say nothing which is not related to human rights is going to stay the way it is. We need to change the cultures. Thank you. I'm former President Lacalle, as you remember, and I had the privilege of coming to this city in 1968, so I'm the only one that visited this little rock 44 years ago. <laughs> uh, I want a very, a very, very pressing uh, uh, issue, quotas. In our country, we have established for the next election one-third of the places for women. Are you for or against? Is it good or not? And is it good forever or just for one election as we did it? Okay, let's, let's just summarize and I'll go right down the panel. We'll stop now on these. Um, the questioner from Jordan said, you know, why are women have a hard time getting The equal status in society, even in countries where they have half or more of the graduates. It's very interesting. Uh, for several years now, more than half of the university graduates in Saudi Arabia have been women. And their big challenge is only about 17, 18% of the workforce is female. And this is an opportune time to be debating this because the Saudis have decided I think quite rightly that they can't have all these people with university degrees and no jobs and seven or eight million guest workers coming from other countries, but they can't have a higher percentage of the jobs filled by Saudis unless a lot of them are women. So they're dealing with this now. So that's the first question she asked. What could we do to guarantee at least that the people who have requisite educational uh, and other qualifications have economic empowerment. The second question, if I understood it, and I think I did, is if we were leading now, could we do better? And should those of us from donor nations condition assistance on strict observance of equality? That is, so she's not really asking those of us from donor countries if we could do a better job in our own country appointing women, empowering them, doing all that, but whether we should have done more in conditioning assistance or we should do more now in a different time conditioning assistance 
on equality. Uh, the minister, former minister from Iran, thinks that we should have very specific objectives that we try to achieve. We should be more specific, like women ought to be able to drive everywhere. <laughs> I, w I spoke at the Jeddah Economic Forum, oh, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. And uh, as a c sort of concession, I think, to me, they allowed women to come for the first time. And then I made the mistake, apparently, of saying, you know, the prophet's first wife was a widow when he married her and a very successful businesswoman. And I believe if she were alive today, she would not only have driven herself here, but she would be running the automobile company. <laughs> I keep hoping I'll get invited back someday. <laughs> we're all friends, but I realized I put them in a difficult position. I didn't mean to. But, you know, in a world where we're friends, where people, you know, no one thinks we're trying to overthrow them or anything. We, we, we have to be, there has to be a space where we can honestly discuss these questions. So I thank you for that. Uh, and finally, we were asked straight out a version of what President Chisano talked about. He says that in, they achieved greater representation in Parliament because his party had a quota in producing the candidate list. You say that uh, under consideration is a quota that there should be a third of the members of parliament, let's say, must be women. Oh, it's a quota for men. No. <laughs> say it again. What, what? Say it again. Say what? You, you must believe half of what he says. <laughs> we come from the same town. No, I ask about quota. Is it good or isn't good? Just like that. Because in my country, uh, when it was voted, some uh, women legislators voted against, saying it was an insult on their intelligence because they were quoted to be elected. But is quota good, is quota bad for women participation? Okay. Who would like to respond? Anybody in order? We'll start here and go all the way down. Yeah, uh, I think that you are right. We have to establish the quotas, but we should not spoil women because they have to fight. Uh, but let we start by letting them fight among themselves to get the, this quota, the highest as possible, and then they compete with men. So but over time, over time, they, they will not need this quota. Over time, they will not need this quota. But, but until the society is uh, conscient of the value of the, the, the quality of men and, and women, then uh, something has to be done. I think what the president is saying that he likes his system better than your proposal. That is, there should be a quota for the number of candidates so you always have a choice of a woman, right? Yes. Not, for the, not for the number of seats, but for the number of candidates that, that, that you found that if you had enough women candidates, a fair number of them would be elected. Yes, and, and then they can compete for more. It's not just for that. Okay. Mary, you want to comment on any of these four things? Okay, uh, first of all, just because it came up first on, on quotas, I think quotas are tools and can be extremely important because otherwise women will not get to that critical mass. <laughs> and it's the critical mass that's important. Um, I would actually love to also, if I may, comment on uh, Felipe Gonzalez's point about changing the story. And I think the story of women's participation is changing. And it's changing in a good direction, despite all the problems. Um, if you look at the economic empowerment of women, um, there's a lot more convincing evidence. And indeed, Secretary of State Clinton made a wonderful speech to the APEC conference in which she set out. There's now McKinsey studies about competitiveness. If women are not in um, the uh, private sector being um, put forward, et cetera. So 
despite the economic downturn problem, I think there is now much more recognition. If we look at what women are doing in the informal sector, the wonderful organizational powers of SEWA in India, the Self-Employed Women's Association, of Waste Pickers International, most of whom are women, um, Slum Dwellers International, we go. Um, supporting women in the informal sector. Uh, you know, the use of social media now for women to, um, to insist that the informal sector be calculated as part of the um, GDP of countries like India. Um, this is a huge change that's taking place. If you look at women in peace and security, um, with the breakthrough now on plans of action for 1325, that women must be at the decision table. The United States, <laughs> again, that, I think that was leadership of Secretary Clinton and Milan Brevere and others, that the United States did adopt a plan of action under 1325. I was doubtful whether it might happen. I was very pleased that it did. And there are over 30 countries, maybe over 40 now, that have plans of action. And we'll talk about it a bit at this conference. Look at the focus on the girl child. I think this is one of the most wonderful things. The girl child is central to development. And um, we saw a very good presentation of the, um, the artistic identity of, of, of a girl at lunchtime. But there are so many different ways. The elders have been focusing on early child marriage. And I've, I've got a partnership going now, which is supported by a number of foundations, including Ford Foundation and others who are here, um, called Girls Not Brides. Um, uh, you know, an incredible gathering of strengths. So um, that, that story is happening. We just need to. Um, to increase it more. And that brings me very briefly to the question from Jordan. I think the problem, because I've been in Jordan and, and other countries where you see women being the majority in universities but not coming into the workplace, and a lot of it is the different responsibilities of women, the different expectations of women. In other words, this work-life balance problem. And um, I, I answer now when I'm asked about work-life balance that men should think about it a lot more. You know, that it's, it's not just an issue for women. And that's, that's the problem that um, and in Saudi Arabia, how do women get to work if they can't drive cars? So there are a lot of barriers still um, to, to women. And I think it's very dramatic that um, they, they, uh, they don't participate as much, um, despite the fact that they have access to third level education. But I do want to come to Manaz Afkami's uh, question, because I think it's a very fundamental one. It's one that I grappled with a lot as High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, this idea that somehow human rights are Western. Um, it's a Western ideology, Western rights. I used to get that quite a lot from leaders of countries that were dictatorships. I never got it from people on the ground who wanted those human rights, particularly women who wanted the rights. And what we learned to do in the UN system, um, and I think it's very important, is to um, distinguish between culture in the full sense and traditional practices that are harmful. So. Um, early child marriage is a harmful traditional practice. Genital cutting is a harmful traditional practice. And I would go further and say um, Sharia law in a fundamentalist sense is a harmful religious practice. Um, and therefore, we should be doing what we can to, um, to now encourage that we shouldn't be allowing these, these issues. Okay, now, you, Ireland is one of the most outward-looking countries in the world. There has not been a day since the founding of the United Nations, not one day, that someone from Ireland has not been in another country trying to make peace or help people. Not one day. I think it's the only country in the world that this is true of. So answer her question. Should those of us, should the United States, should Ireland, should the EU, should we condition our foreign assistance on the observance of equal uh, rights or equal opportunities for women and men? I honestly don't know that conditioning foreign assistance is necessarily. I think it's more that we, uh, that we recognize um, that uh, in the 21st century, we have achieved a basic um, sense of women's rights being human rights, as was said in Beijing um, by Secretary Clinton, as it happens, and was reflecting what a l had come up in a lot of different ways. And therefore, this should be part of our efforts to try to make changes. But I'm not sure that the economic lever is always the best one on that. It's, a, it's complicated, but um, having that kind of conditionality can also be, be difficult. But I think be, having it as part of an overall foreign policy, um, uh, friendship policy, that, you know, we, we, that we're moving in the right direction. And that includes what's happening in Egypt at the moment, in Tunisia, et cetera, to try to really encourage that in the 21st century, this is better for the countries, and therefore every 
every form of, of persuasion, but I'm, I'm not sure that a straightforward um, trying to make it part of, um, of economic um, aid policy is, is a good idea. Let me offer you an alternative that I think would work better. A few years ago at the Clinton Global Initiative, you know, we, we meet at the opening of the UN, we bring government and business and philanthropy together with NGOs. We started highlighting women and girls issues. And just a few years, we got almost 150 commitments worth $1.7 billion, which showed that there was a lot of interest in this among businesses as well as NGOs. One of the things that frustrated me when I was president is, actually, Hillary suggested this to me. She said, you should start meeting with NGO leaders when you go to foreign countries and not just government leaders or opposition. If there's civil society there, meet with them too. And it, in the beginning, it made a lot of the leaders of government, including some who were my friends, nervous when I did it in Russia, when I did it in Turkey, when I did it in Central America. But people got used to it. You know, they, they, they it, I went to a little coffee shop in Delhi and met with a bunch of NGO leaders in India. They were used to it because it was a big part of their lives. But I think that now enough time has passed that donors should consider maybe not cutting off aid if a government doesn't have equal treatment because you're trying to lead things in the right way. But you should say, if you want us to give assistance, let's say in the security area and other areas, you have to let us work with the NGOs to try to prove, to demonstrate to your people and to your leaders that empowering women is an essential part of building a just and a, an economically successful 21st century society. And if we did it that way, I think it would be more effective. Anyway, that's my take. I want you to be able to answer these questions. Uh, I want to give a response, sort of a summary response. Uh, I am for quota, uh, absolutely firmly for quota. We can't develop uh, women, especially in the uh, developing countries, uh, and so if a burden of uh, our cultural heritage and religious heritage, so, I mean, there will be no women on the landscape, political landscape. And then uh, one uh, such a very special remark, being uh, from the authoritarian country, I can tell you that today, for the authoritarian leaders, uh, there is a plenty of uh, big field to uh, um, promote women. It depends only from one pen, from one man. He can just sign and tell uh, she will be minister, she will be another minister, and so on. He doesn't need sort of uh, approval of the parliament seriously. So it is in democratic country. So that's why I think uh, for the authoritarian country, I would uh, said, uh, I would really demand from them that they should uh, have much more women. And today, you should know also that if uh, in authoritarian countries you have so many women, it's just to decorate themselves, you know? They, they show that uh, how uh, modern they are, how uh, good they are, but uh, in fact, uh, uh, all right, this is good for women, but if, uh, they are opening new talents, new gifts of women. But uh, this is uh, parts of the life. Uh, uh, being uh, in the authoritarian country, I know these uh, uh, secrets. Uh, I want to tell you that um, be, uh, if uh, I would be uh, still, let's say, in the power, uh, a lot of things to do. We just come to the point that, uh, yes, we have a lot of women as labor force, but uh, to promote them up to the members of the board of directors of big companies. This is a trendy topic now in the world. Uh, a lot of research is going around uh, about this topic in developing as well as in developed countries. So in our countries, we're 
uh, not everything is privatized. We have plenty of those big industries where big money generated. Uh, and uh, I do believe that uh, we are just coming to opening new opportunities, new, f new fields for the women. Does the EU now have a requirement of board membership? Um, no, no, Norway, I think. Only um, Norway? Yeah. Not yet. It's talking about it. The Parliament yeah, it's talking, talking about, about it. it. Yeah. Board memberships for companies, 40%, right? But what the European Commission decided, does anything else have to be done for it to bind, be bound? So the, the European Commission has recommended that in the, in the EU that 40% of the board members be women, but the European Parliament and the Council have not approved it yet. Got it. I got it. So it will be for three, five, eight years. So long term perspective, not immediately. So let me give Felipe Gonzalez a chance to answer, and then I'll call on Leonel Jospin. Um, should there be quotas? Should there be specific issues? Should the world community say, we think women everywhere ought to be able to drive? Um, I'll give you another example where I work a lot in agriculture. Should every farmer, woman or man, be able to get his or her crops to market without paying half their income, half their annual income, to get it just because there's not a road? And when women are alone supporting their children, they have no chance, none, if they have to give away half their income because they don't have a decent road or any mobility. You want to do something to help women, I mean, that's what these little farm projects that I do, double, triple, quadruple. In one case, we quintupled a widow's income because we just took her crops to market. That's not all we did, but there, I, I think the idea of a specific set of goals that may seem simple but are totally elusive. Should every woman who has to carry something on her head to get water every day at least have access to clean water? Um, we just announced in Nigeria, as you know, President Abbas and Joe, an effort to try to save a million lives of children uh, now vulnerable because of dirty water to death from diarrhea. So the, I think that uh, in revisiting the Millennium Development Goals, there's something to what she, uh, she said, being quite specific about the things that most affect most women's lives around the world. But President Gonzalez, and then we'll go to Lionel. Lionel. Vamos a ver, el tema de las cuotas, más allá de la broma que le hacía al presidente de la calle, eh, no ha habido ningún avance en la igualdad de oportunidades, amplío el concepto a la igualdad de derechos, en la igualdad de oportunidades que no haya pasado por mecanismos de discriminación positiva. Lo mismo ha ocurrido con los derechos de las minorías, En Estados Unidos ocurría esa política de discriminación política y positiva respecto de la minoría afroamericana. Nosotros hablamos de los países donde una mujer no puede conducir, pero nos olvidamos de que hace 40 años, 40 años en España, una mujer no podría contratar sin autorización del marido. O sea, estaba capiti disminuida. Hace 40 años, no hace... 80 o 90. Por tanto, respecto de las cuotas, el debate intelectualmente se resiste bien. Dice, parece un insulto a la mujer que haya una cuota del 40%. No es un insulto, aunque se puede interpretar así. El problema es que si se valorara la capacidad para ocupar un puesto en el Parlamento o en, o en la Facultad de Medicina o en la dirección de una empresa. La capacidad y de verdad funcionar a la igualdad sin discriminación ni positiva ni negativa, en España el 60% de 
de los mejores expedientes universitarios son de mujeres. Por tanto, tendrían una capacitación mayor que la de los hombres para todos los niveles de estudios de posgrado, de grado, etcétera, todos los que se han analizado. Por eso hablaba de que habría que reservar el 40% para los hombres, porque si no nos van a barrer. Cuando funciona, cuando funcione de verdad, lo digo de broma, pero en serio, la igualdad de oportunidades hombre-mujer, si eso se puede medir de acuerdo con la evaluación de sus expedientes escolares, universitarios o de posgrado, la cuestión está clara, es mucho más el rendimiento de la mujer que el rendimiento del hombre. Y sin embargo, el acceso a la responsabilidad sigue siendo mucho más el del hombre que el de la mujer. Si lo confesamos llanamente, no con ideología, ¿por qué? Porque sigue siendo una lucha de poder. Y en la lucha de poder, los que mantienen la cuota mayor de poder se resisten a perderla, punto. Los hombres siguen resistiéndose a perder la cuota de poder de la que han disfrutado desde la eternidad, parece, ¿no? Porque no hay memoria histórica. Por tanto, estoy por la discriminación positiva. Voy a decirte una estadística interesante. Los Estados Unidos tiene una falta de even with our high unemployment rate, we have lots of open jobs in what we call the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. If the participation in these fields from women, Latin American, and African American men were the same as males of European, Middle Eastern, and Asian heritage, we would have no shortage. We would be as well stocked as any country in the world. So we, these are things we have to think of. We have 120,000 jobs open every year for people in computer science in America, and we're only putting out 40,000 graduates. So I think that that goes back to Felipe's story. The quotas might help, but it would also help if we made a more aggressive effort to change the culture to empower the women to do these things which will assure their success. Now, in poorer societies, it's a different story, but that's an interesting statistic, isn't it? I mean, we would eliminate our shortage if participation rates were constant across women and men and across all of our ethnic groups. Uh, Lena Jospin had a question. Thank you. Mr. President, I just wanted to show that in the case of France, uh, the quota approach was effective. The women in France had the right to vote only after the Second World War. Uh, the women in the parliament in the two chambers were till the 80s, in the 80s yes, uh, less than 5%. Uh, when Mitterrand was elected as president after 81, uh, the Minister of uh, Women, Yvette Rudy, a f feminist, uh, proposed a, a law to create a quota, 20%. This law was declared unconstitutional by our Constitutional Council, uh, which is not exactly a Supreme Court, uh, because uh, it was contrary to the idea of equality, because the women were a minority, which was a very interesting construction. So it was not possible to establish a quota. When I was prime minister, uh, we wanted to establish a quota, and so we had to change the constitution, and we did. I had the agreement uh, of the President Chirac, and so we had a Congress and we vote a change in the Constitution. And when we say what quota could it be, I discuss with the members of my majority and with the socialists, and they say, how much it is? And I said, it's 50-50. That will be the quota. 
and it had been applied where it could be applied, which means in the election where we had a proportional scrutiny uh, on list. Which means that now in France, for the European election, for the local election, municipal election, for the regional election, where we have a least proportional uh, scrutiny, would you say? Uh, the, there is a pure parity, 50% of women, 30% of men. We have an obstacle, which is that the election to the Chamber of Deputies is a uninominal a scrutiny. And so it's very difficult to have women. You, we use, in that case, financial sanction for the parties who not present enough women. But the fact that during uh, now 15 years, women have become member of the parliament, European parliament, mayor, member of the executive in the region, president of region for some of them, has changed more or less the culture, the mentality. And it's permit to the party, at least to my party, uh, to present much more women, even in the uninominal ballot. Which means that, for instance, for my party, 40% of the MPs today, today in the new uh, assembly are women. And for the first time, the new president of France uh, present a government uh, as Zapatero, I thought, uh, did, uh, which is a pure paritarian uh, government. So I think that even if it does not solve the problem of wages, uh, of violence, of prostitution, of a lot of problems who concern women, that in the political field, uh, the quota could be effective. It has been in France. I want to give this testimony. Thank you. Um, it's time to stop. Yes? Okay, it's time to stop. We've got to go, but you've got a busy program. I want to leave you with an interesting thing to think about, because we would be an hour if we tried to discuss this, but I want you to think about this. I think one of the most important things we could do in the entire world to change the way people feel about women and equal rights is to end the use of widespread rape as a weapon of war. Now, uh, before you clap, you asked me, well, would I do a better job this time around? When I was president, I'm proud of what we did to stop ethnic cleansing in the Balkans, and I regret profoundly that we didn't send a few thousand troops to reduce the number of people killed in Rwanda. 85% of people killed in Rwanda were men, but it was a tragedy. But if you look at the places, let's just take Africa, where, where rape is widely used as a weapon of war, like in, in the Congo, you have these vast expanses of, of land, inaccessible places. Who would make the decision to do what? What would you do there? If it had, President Obasanjo was here, that, that when I was president and we worked on a training network for the, the troops in West Africa, if it hadn't been for the Nigerians, we could not have really worked out the aftermath of what happened in Sierra Leone or Liberia or any other place. In, way, in, in Darfur, when the African Union took over, the vast majority of the troops were from Nigeria and Rwanda. So, there's a capacity issue here. And who does what? And how do they physically do it if there is no organized country, no in, in, uh, easy ingress and egress? Who gives authority? Who does what? But you all think about that. You want to do something to prove the world really cares about the dignity of women? What could we do to stop mass rape as an ordinary, customary weapon of war? This has been great. Let's give our panelists a hand. Thank you very much.